All right, you ready for the Word of God? Yeah. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to what is perhaps the easiest book of the Bible to find, Genesis. And uh, Genesis, I'm going to read a passage from chapter 14. And before I read this, I want to set the scene for you. It'll save me from reading a much larger passage of Scripture. We're all pretty much familiar with a few of the names in this story. Uh, for one, I'm, I, I imagine all of us have heard of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, two of the most wicked cities. They were full of people that were just evil. And if you ever study about the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, it seems in this story, if I could set the scene, um, there were some kings who allied themselves together to come against some other kings. I believe it was five kings against four. And as you read down through the story, uh, it tells us that there were four kings that seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food, and then they went away. And ordinarily, righteous people wouldn't care a whole lot about what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, would we? Especially if it was something destructive, because they were so evil. But the story tells us that they made a big mistake. In verse 12, it says that they also carried off a man named Lot, who happened to be the nephew of a righteous man named Abram, or later would be named Abraham. And so they carried off Abram's nephew and his possessions because Lot was living in Sodom. He probably shouldn't have even been living there. But I think he was probably about nine-tenths backslidden at the time. And so he was living there. Now, there was a man who escaped and went to where Abraham, the Hebrew, was and told him about his nephew being taken captive. And I'm picking up the story in Genesis 14, verse 14, if you would join me there. When Abram, that is Abraham, heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. After Abram returned from defeating Keterlomer, the kings allied, and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom, came out to meet Abraham in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Then another king named Mel Melchizedek. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed God. Listen to this blessing. This is what he said. Blessed be Abram, by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. And how many of you know a tenth is a tithe? Now look at verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and you keep the goods for yourself. He's trying to make a deal with Abraham. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, with raised hand, I have sworn an oath to the Lord, most God most high, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. 
I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me to Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them have their share. And I want to talk to you. I've titled this message, Not a Thread or a Sandal Strap. Let me say a prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, God, that you are the one who blesses your people. I thank you that with your blessing, there will never be anything this world has to offer that we will need. And I pray, God, that when we leave this place, we will have been changed and sanctified by the power of your word and the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I, um, I want to talk to you today about something that is important not only to your walk with the Lord, but it is also vitally important to your witness of the Lord, for the Lord, in the earth. I want to talk to you about your integrity. I want to talk to you about the importance of, of being a person of integrity and holding to your convictions and holding to your integrity even when others around you would not and are not. But I can't tell you how many times in my life I have been witnessing to someone and telling them about Jesus and encouraging them to accept the Lord and, and become a Christian only to hear them say something to this effect. Well, you know, I know so and so and he goes to church or I know so and so and, and you know, he's claims to be a Christian, but he lives like the devil. And some of you have had experiences like that where you have <clears throat> seen firsthand how a person with a lack of integrity, how that has affected their witness in the earth. But I want you to understand you, you, can, you can spend years building and strengthening your integrity and you can lose it with one bad decision. In fact, you, you can... You can I think if you, if you keep your integrity, God can use you to reach the most difficult sinner, the hardest heart. But when God's people forfeit their integrity, I would venture to say that God can't hardly use you to be a witness. But he can use you to be a testimony of what not to be. And I want to also tell you this morning that, you know, <clears throat> the difficulty in holding on to your integrity, it's, it's, never been, it's never been hard for me to hold on to my integrity when I'm in church. It's never been difficult for me to hold on to integrity when I'm carrying my Bible or reading scripture. But the difficulty comes when life is difficult and when the enemy is most tempting you or me to compromise, that's the time we need to really guard our integrity. We need to guard it when we're tired and weary, not when we're in the middle of revival fires. We need to guard our integrity and, and do what's right even when no one is looking and when others are judging you or, or when life is unfair. Even if it costs you a dear price to do what's right, don't ever let the seed of righteousness fade from your heart. And so no matter how difficult your battle is today, I want to challenge you with this message. And I want to I just want to let me get into the, the meat of what I want to tell you and talk to you about. I want to I want to begin by talking about a thread of compromise, a thread of compromise. You know, my dad used to have a saying that he would say to my brother and me growing up. He would say, son, the devil doesn't tie us down with ropes and chains. The devil ties us down with threads and he does it with one thread at a time so subtly that you don't even feel it and you don't even know that he's tying you down. 
And so in this story, this thread or this sandal strap represents the temptation to compromise in some area of our integrity. And if you think about it, Satan's plan really hasn't changed much. His strategy or his technique, I think, is still pretty much the same as it was in the garden. Because when he came to Eve in the garden, you know, really all he did was just challenge her just to compromise a little bit. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, is it really a big deal if you just eat this fruit from this tree. I mean, it's good to eat. You can see that it's good for food. And in the grand scheme of things, the compromises that he presents to us are really small in comparison to other things. He doesn't usually tempt us to compromise when we're holding our Bibles in our hands. Satan knows that he can't get people in fact, let me say it this way. He can't get a nation to totally throw away their morals all at once. But if I can just get these people to just be a little bit more tolerant, there's a word we know, on this particular thing. I'm not asking you to just throw your morals out and say you agree with this. I'm just asking you to tolerate this little area of immorality if people choose to live this way. That's a thread. Maybe if I could just get them to be a little less judgmental on this thing. That's a thread. And the Bible is full of stories of men and women who were challenged with a thread of compromise and they had to make a decision about whether or not they would hold their integrity in the heat of the moment. We read of men like Joseph, who was presented with just a thread, just a sandal strap of compromise. But he chose to hold on to his integrity when he fled from the arms of another man's wife who had propositioned him. Oh, what a threat it would be for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego to just, just bow down. I mean, we don't even have to say anything worshipful to this image. All we have to do is just bow the knee and nobody will even know that we really believe in God. We read of men like Daniel who refused to compromise his principles on something as simple as prayer even though it was at the risk of his own life. I think about men like Moses, who the Bible says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Do you hear this? This is talking about Moses in the Old Testament, esteeming the reproach of Christ in the New Testament of greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward that does not come from Egypt. Amen. Hallelujah. And by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, and he endured as seeing him who is invisible. If you look at the word integrity, it speaks of having moral principles, a moral uprightness. And it has to do with the fact that you stand for something and it is your integrity that determines things like your reputation. I, I've told my sons many times, how many of you have ever been, how many of you have ever had somebody lie about you? Lie about your character. I don't know how many times I've said to my son, if somebody lies about me, I make it my life's goal to live my life in such a way as to prove them a liar. But the reputation of a thousand years 
can be determined by what you do in one moment. Satan doesn't tempt us to compromise our integrity while we're holding our Bibles or while we're sitting in church. But with just a thread, he'll, comp he'll, he'll challenge us to compromise while we're at work. Or maybe it's while we're at a ball game or while we're texting someone. And he'll whisper and say, it's no big deal. It's just a thread. It's just a sandal strap. But God is looking for a people who are people of integrity when everyone around you is compromising or faltering and others are maybe even mocking you and challenging you on what you're standing on, the principles that you uphold. God wants a people who will say, I'm not going to bow. I'm not going to let go of my faith. I won't give up. I'm going to hold to the ways of God. I'm going to keep believing and keep praying. And I'm going to keep walking that straight and narrow path, even if it means walking it alone. I'm not going to compromise my principles. I'll hold to my morals no matter what others think about me or say about me. Let me secondly talk a few minutes about the value of integrity in your life. I don't know if you've ever reached a point in your life where you, and I'm not taking, I'm not asking for anybody to raise their hand where you have thought to yourself, is it really worth it? I mean, even in the Bible, we read of one man who said, surely I have washed my hands in vain. I've served you, Lord, in vain, because all of the wicked seem to be the ones getting the blessings. They wear, they wear it like a necklace, pride, like a necklace, and it's the righteous who seem to be suffering. Have you ever, have you ever felt that way? But integrity is important. First of all, the Bible says that integrity guides you. Proverbs 11.3, the integrity of the upright will guide them. That means when life is going crazy, and your situation is about to overwhelm you, and you don't know which way to go or what to do, if you'll just hold on to your integrity, it will keep you on track. In fact, the Hebrew word translated as guide can even have the understanding of transporting you if you'll just hold on to your integrity it'll get you from where you are to where you're going Amen. secondly your integrity preserves you and keeps you psalm 25 verse 21 says let integrity and uprightness preserve me for i wait for you and in verse 19 he had just prayed to god and said consider my enemies for they are many and here he says, it's my integrity that will preserve me. That means to guard or to protect. And so God will literally, when you hold your integrity, God will hide you under the shadow of his wing. He'll protect you from your enemies. David said, you uphold me in my integrity and set me before your face. Proverbs 10, 9 says, he who walks with integrity walks securely something else integrity does it'll bring the blessing of god into your life and i'm going to talk about this a little bit more as i get to the end of where i want to go with this but i just want you to know that if you'll keep to your integrity and not compromise it'll bring the blessing of god into your life but more than that it'll be such a blessing that the bible says it will flow down to your children we find this in proverbs 20 verse 7 the righteous man walks in his integrity his children are blessed after him who i love that i love that because i have children you understand don't ever don't ever believe the lie of the devil that the way you live your life has no effect on your children when you go through hard times and difficulties and your, your integrity is most challenged, those are the times your children are watching you the most. And the Bible also tells us that if you are a person of integrity, God will vindicate you, judge you, and uphold you according to your integrity. Let me talk to you specifically 
about Abraham's decision. When we come upon this story in Genesis 14, and I kind of set the scene for you, these kings have come together to attack Sodom and Gomorrah, and they've had a successful battle. They made the grave mistake of also taking a righteous man's nephew. Lot, by the way, was like a son to Abraham. Apparently, in Lot's life, he had lost his father, and Abraham became a father figure to him. And so they made the mistake of taking someone that Abraham, a righteous man, loved. Now, ordinarily, Abraham wouldn't care about the fact that Sodom and Gomorrah had been defeated because they were evil cities full of wicked people who did things that would be embarrassing for me to talk about in a pulpit. But I want you to see something. Abraham made a, a commitment <clears throat> to the Lord. And I want you to understand that he had told God, if you'll give me the victory, I will not keep any of the spoils. Let me point out to you that by the law and the rules and so forth of war in that time, in that culture, he had every right to the spoils of war. Because whoever brought the victory was the one who got the bounty. But he wasn't interested in things. He was interested in a person named Lot. I'm troubled that sometimes we're more interested in things than we are people. Amen. Abraham gathered his men and he pursued the enemy. He returns from the battle. And it is when he comes back from this battle that he is faced with what is an even bigger battle. So understand that sometimes the greatest danger you face is after you have won a battle. I don't worry about failing God when I'm preparing to preach on Sunday or when I'm standing in a pulpit preaching his word to you. You know, when I need to really be worried is when I walk out of the pulpit or when we leave this church and we walk back into the presence of the king of Sodom. It was after the capture of Jericho that Israel's self-confidence led to their defeat at Ai. I want you to understand that your integrity is most challenged when you are tired from the battle and when you have had a great victory. And here it is in the case of Abraham. Abraham comes back from battle and he is met by two kings. There's Bera, king of Sodom, and there is Melchizedek, king of Salem. Bera offered Abram, Abraham all the spoils in return for the people. I want you to get a picture of this because Bera is a representation of the things of this world and this world system. And Melchizedek, the Bible teaches us that he is a type of Christ to us. He is a king and priest. And so standing here in front of Abraham are two choices. The things of this world and the things of God. And here, here is the king of Sodom who is offering to Abraham what is rightfully Abraham's. He says, you, you keep all of the things, the riches, the spoils, and just give me the people. And then here is Melchizedek standing here saying, let me give you bread and wine, which of course is a picture of the blood and body of Jesus Christ. It's, a, it's the way of the Lord. And he offers him the blessing of God. One king offers him the blessings of this world. The other king offers him the blessings of God. Isn't it amazing? How Bera, in fact the name Bera, it's interesting, it means gift in Hebrew. So here's this worldly king saying, I'll, I'll make you rich. 
I'll give you a gift if you'll just give me the people. Isn't that just like the devil? Suggesting that the world will bargain for your allegiance. But we forget that the name Sodom means burning. So you need to be careful when you make these choices because you can choose one thing, but if you choose the wrong thing, it may be a wonderful gift and you may be wealthy in the world's definition of wealth, but one day things are going to be burned up. Who wants a blessing from a king whose kingdom is about to be destroyed by God? And here is Melchizedek, who is king of Salem. And while Bera's name means gift and Sodom means burning, Melchizedek's name means king of righteousness and Salem means peace. And he stands in front of Abram and says, it is God who blesses you. We used to sing a chorus that said, take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. And I just want to cry out, where have we lost our vision as a church in this country that we would rather have what the world has to offer than what Jesus has to offer? We stand before the king of Salem, we stand before the king of Sodom, and we stand before the king of Salem, and we have a choice to make. Now, interestingly, legally, Abraham has the right to claim the spoils of this war. What do you mean, pastor? I mean, it's not wrong for him to say, I'll take the spoils. There's a legal thing that says, yeah, he has a right to do this. He has a right to have this. But there's a moral thing that says, if you take what's rightfully yours in this matter, it's going to compromise the purpose of God in your victory. What do you mean, pastor? I mean that there are some things this world will tell you it's legal. But it's not a matter of legalities or what the world deems as legal. It's what, the, it's what God deems as holy and morally pure that we must decide on. Amen. Paul said that even though things may be legal, it doesn't mean that they're good for me. So Abraham could take the spoils. He had a legal right to them. But there are many things in this world that are legal as far as the courts have decided. But morally they're wrong as far as God's people are concerned. And so Bera threw out a compromise. Just a thread. Just a thread. And Melchizedek came and said I love this blessed to be Abraham by God most high creator of heaven and earth and praise be to God most high who delivered your enemies into your hands and he brought out bread and wine so he has a choice Abraham can choose to live by the blessings of the Lord or he can choose to be bribed by the world. Understand it was God who had told Abraham, I will bless you. And now stands the king of Sodom saying, I will bless you. Is that not what he did to Jesus when, when Satan said, if you'll just bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms of the world. He's offering to Jesus what is already Christ's. And he'll offer to you and to me and all of us what really he doesn't have to offer in the first place. Amen. And so Abram made a choice. Melchizedek met Abram after the battle, listen to me, to strengthen him for the victory. Because it's after the victory that we're most tempted 
to fall. I've lived for the Lord a long time. A hundred and something years, it feels like. Abram says to this wicked king, in essence, you don't have anything I'll ever need and I'll never be so poor that I will need anything, any of these wicked things that the world has to offer. And I love what he said, lest you get the credit for blessing me. Melchizedek reminds Abraham that your blessings will come from the Lord. And I just want to tell you something. I mean, Abraham in essence says, and, and this is the stand we must take, I will only be blessed by the hand of God or I will not be blessed at all. Because I don't need the blessings of this world because the blessings of this world are not really blessings at all. Now, I'm going to end with this. You say, well, what's the big deal? He had the legal right to have these spoils, these blessings of war. What's the big deal? The big deal is his backslidden nephew Lot was watching him. And your witness will never be greater to your children, your grandchildren, your co-workers, than when your integrity is challenged and you refuse to take a thread or a sandal strap that this world has to offer. Your witness will never be greater. And you wanna know the end of the story? Abraham made the choice. He said, I won't take a thread from you and I won't take a sandal strap from you because my blessings will come from God. And in the very opening of chapter 15, it opens like this. After this, after he made that commitment, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Listen to what God said to him. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. There's an alternate translation there that says, you will be rewarded greatly. And boy, that is a word for somebody this morning from God, that if you'll just keep holding to your integrity, stand firm in your faith, your reward is coming and it's gonna be a great reward. And you can take this whole world, but give me Jesus, hallelujah. Not a thread, not a sandal strap. I will hold to the things of God and I will live my life for Him until Jesus comes back. If that's your commitment, would you stand with me and join your faith with me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. How many of you needed this? Besides me, anybody? Uh, let me pray for us this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God, I lift up a thanks to you. I praise you for the blessings in my life. I thank you for the times that even though the enemy has a way of whispering and saying you could have so much more, I thank you, God, that your voice spoke to my heart and said, I have something better. I have a blessing for you. I'll take the, I'll take the wine and the bread over the spoils of war. I'll take the ways of God, the things of God, over the things of this world. And I pray, God, for all who have heard this message, those who are struggling with their faith because of the challenge that's been placed in front of them, I pray, God, that you will give them the strength and the courage to stand strong and to know that you reward the faithful. Hallelujah. I pray, God, that we'll stand in our integrity and let it be a witness to the lost. God, let the world see the integrity of your people in the church. And Lord, I pray that it will speak loudly to this world that there is a right way and a wrong way and there's a broad path and a narrow path. And God, help us to lead others into the kingdom of heaven. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit. And I pray, God, that we'll be changed by the power.
power of your word and the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.